Association for the History of Transport, Traffic, and Mobility. She is an interdisciplinary scholar with interests also in Caribbean studies, mobilities research, and social theory. She is the co-principal investigator for the NOAACAP Caribbean Climate Adaptation Network. And she has published more than 140 articles and book chapters and, in, and is an author or co-editor of 15 books, including Advanced Introduction to Mobilities, Caribbean Sur Island Futures, Caribbean Survival in the, in the Anthropocene, Mobility Justice, the Politics of Movement in an Age of Extremes, and Aluminum Dreams, the Making of Light Modernity. So I don't even know where, where to begin with this, but I think it suffices to say that um, Professor Scheller's impacts uh, are well known uh, inside and outside of academia. Uh, you know, just many, many actually different transport, like huge contributions to the theory of understanding mobility and with recent advances in mobility justice. And of course, her book is the kind of uh, lends its name to our project, Mobilizing Justice, and that's by no accident. We're a great admirer of your work, Mimi, and we're so very pleased to have you here and looking forward to hearing your thoughts and the discussion that follows. So please welcome me with a quick clap <laughs> and get away, Mimi. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen, for that really, truly generous introduction. I'm delighted to be with you. I'm thrilled that you're um, adopting Mobilizing Justice as um, the theme for your work. And um, I imagine, let me begin by saying, um, I'm speaking to you from uh, the state of Massachusetts in the United States. You've probably already done a land acknowledgement where you are, but let me just recognize um, the people of the Nipmuc tribe here in Massachusetts as the traditional custodians of the land on which we work. And I wanna take just a moment to honor their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, my institution WPI, uh, which we pronounce Worcester, Polytechnic Institute strongly advocates for higher education um, professionals, institutions, faculty to honor the land, the original tribal occupants and the history of where we are located. So um, <laughs> Worcester, yes. And I'm going to share my screen. Uh, let's make, see if this works. Okay, we've got some slides. Can you see those? Yes. Okay, great. So the title of my talk today is Mobilizing an Ethics of Care for Mobility Justice. And I've given, um, written on this theme and talked on this theme in various different contexts. And I hope the parts of it that I wanna pull out today are relevant to the symposium and, and to the, the discussions you've been having so far, I realize I'm kind of coming in a little bit at the end, um, but the topics I wanna to talk about are first a little bit about sustainable mobility transitions and the kind of utopian or hopeful uh, processes that are happening right now, but also some of the more dystopian aspects of, of what we're seeing. And that will lead into a, a discussion about mobility justice and um, its foundation in a just sustainability framework. And then some kind of thoughts towards the idea of mobile commoning as an ethics of care. And I admit this is fairly theoretical work. It's, uh, I'm not going to be presenting specific empirical um, research or, or data collection, which I understand some of your other um, panelists have been speaking about. Um, but I wanna begin by talking about the ways in which North, um, North American cities in particular, um, I'll, I'll focus on a little bit uh, today, are facing and have been facing these questions of how to make the transition towards more sustainable mobilities. And this has really been happening at, um, at least since the beginning of the 21st century, where we've seen in a policy making and urban planning and transport planning, many efforts to begin to change how 
societies become mobile, um, how we use transportation, and more broadly, how we understand the relationship between mobilities and societies. And of course, as my late colleague John Uri put it, um, how we think about um, you know, sociology beyond societies and, and what mobilities imply for the whole idea of the social. So sociologists have been theorizing and studying these new patterns of mobilities and immobilities and calling for greater transportation equity and mobility justice for a while now, but also urban policymakers are kind of advocating for these plans um, and incentives to guide cities towards new mobility futures. And that includes ideas about safer streets, more active transport, reducing automobile dependence, um, investment in public transport, and so on. At the same time, we also see these kind of transport futurists, innovators, entrepreneurs, who have been proclaiming various kinds of revolutions or new mobility paradigms in um, shared mobility, electric, connected, autonomous, uh, different different models of, of sort of where we're heading with that. And with that has come new technologies, new business models, design concepts, and, and really um, what seem to be shifts in kind of cultural desires that may be challenging what was the dominant automobility system that took hold in the 20th century. So in general, you could say that with the dawning awareness of the climate crisis and the urgent need to decarbonize fossil fuel transportation systems, many thinkers, activists, designers, and policymakers have been advocating for and implementing this sustainability transition. Safer streets, transit-oriented development, walking, biking, placemaking. Um, and we've seen these kind of high profile developments in certain cities um, where, you know, the, these new um, micro mobilities and active and multimodal mobilities are being built into the city. So in that sense, you could say we're in a period of many new narratives, new technologies, new mobility policies and experiments that have involved really a lot of optimism about developments uh, that that you know in range from shared digital micro mobilities to autonomous and electric and virtual mobilities, um, smart mobilities, and even the craze now for automated robotic and and drone mobilities. But I want to emphasize that at the same time we are also experiencing a period of multiple mobility injustices, and this includes disrupted mobilities, arrested mobilities, carceral mobilities, forced mobilities, and also a whole host of new kinds of surveilled, splintered, and uneven mobilities at this intersection of some of these new technologies and, uh, and platforms for mobilities. And we're also, despite the push for sustainability, we're seeing many unsustainable and even deadly mobilities. So how do we make sense of these tensions and these shifting currents in mobility futures? What kinds of economic forces, social practices, cultural trends, and contested politics are shaping future mobilities as sustainable or unsustainable? And how are these emergent mobilities, mobilities also shaping our planetary future? What kinds of cities, what kinds of nations, what kinds of states, uh, what kinds of transnational regimes of mobilities are emerging. So the way I think about it, of course, grows out of this um, field that we, we've referred to as the new mobilities paradigm. Um, when John Ari and I first published that um, article in 2006, it kind of became a shorthand um, for referring to the sort of changing thought in the social sciences. And here I quote um, a view from uh, the 2016 article we wrote on the sort of 10 year anniversary of the new mobilities paradigm, which had been the introduction to a special issue we co-edited of environment um, and space, um, sorry, environment and, uh, oh, getting the name of the journal, environment and society. Um, and this updated version was called mobilizing the new mobilities paradigm. Uh, 
And we talked about the many sites that were emerging uh, from the, the Center for Mobility's research that we co-founded at Lancaster and then spreading all across Europe to various other um, centers, departments, labs, and then into the Americas, um, into Canada, Australia, Brazil, and so on. Uh, and now a number of new academies uh, that incorporate mobility humanities. And uh, I'd be interested to, to sort of think with your group, how, how did the, the idea of mobility justice move into your specific context? Uh, you know, we trace the sort of movement of the paradigm and the tracing of the thinking about mobilities. And in this work on the new mobilities paradigm, we were kind of bringing to bear these interdisciplinary and innovative new ways to study mobilities, to experiment with mobilities, to transform them. And we talked about um, imagining the era after the car. What would a post-car and a post-carbon transition look like? How was it coming about? What would help advance it? But out of all of this work, a darker side to mobility transitions began to emerge. So we were very much aware of mobility injustices and the way in which dominant mobility regimes were driving transitions that were not necessarily serving the needs of all people. And specifically in which even so-called green transitions or sustainability transitions were very uneven and unequal. And that led to the, um, the ideas around mobility justice. And I'm gonna to turn to, to this um, concept, which emerged um, you know, both in academia and in activist um, engaged sort of social movements. And, and that's interesting to me too, of sort of how around 2018, when my book came out, Mobility Justice, The Politics of Movement in an, in an Age of Extremes, while I was, finishing that book, I was also becoming aware of social movements that were using the mobility justice concept. So while much attention has been given to sustainable transportation as a response to um, the need for climate adaptation, the, the gist of this work is that any kind of sustainable mobility transition must encompass wider mobility justice concerns. The introduction of cleaner vehicles, alternative fuels, active transport, cycling infrastructure, or improved public transportation systems will promote sustainability only in a very limited sense if those changes are not coupled with reconfigurations of wider power relations and what I call kinopolitical practices. So power and inequality are embedded in the governance and control of all forms of mobility and immobility, which is kind of written as a word with the parentheses there to emphasize how they're always connected. And the dominant mobility regimes are premised on these differential immobilities, mobilities that have deep historical roots in patriarchy, colonialism, imperialism, and racial capitalism, as I argue in the book. So, we can say that there's a flip side to the optimistic story and hopeful story of recent mobility transitions and the drive towards low carbon technologies, because contrary to the hopes of sustainable urban planning and the utopias promised by techno futurists, there are these extreme mobility injustices and uneven mobilities built into the system or to the mobility regime, and they lead in these more dystopian directions. While mobility has been improving for some people, for others, it has become inaccessible or downright harmful. And for the planet as a whole, it is not clear that societies are reducing their use of fossil fuels quickly enough, in part because of these uneven and unequal mobilities. So while some wealthy people are living highly mobile lives and taking advantage of kind of the protected cocoons of low stress travel and multi-locational networking. On the other hand, there's growing transport disadvantage and social exclusion. There are deep patterns of splintered urbanism, as Graham and Marvin called it, 
that give some groups access while cutting off others or relegating them to stressful and difficult processes of moving. There are inequities in the overall design of transportation systems that erode their capability to meet basic needs. And there are also increasingly differential mobility regimes. That is regimes that govern who can move or not under highly unequal conditions. And uh, Charles T. Brown and colleagues have referred to this as arrested mobility. Arrested mobility is the process by which the capacity of people of color, especially black people, to move freely and safely is limited by poor infrastructure, policy and planning decisions and enforcement that are shaped by structural racism. And you can see the ways in which this is built into the system, especially in the United States, where structural racism, racialization of mobilities and the over-policing of criminalized or illegal mobilities leaves Black, in, Indigenous, and Latinx populations especially disadvantaged. For example, pedestrians and cyclists' deaths have continued to rise uh, in recent years, despite the efforts towards vision zero design interventions. Here in the United States in 2021, an estimated uh, 42,915 people died in car crashes, and in 2022, again, similar amounts. And this was a 10.5% increase over 2020. Globally, of course, approximately you know, 1.3 million people or more die in road crashes each year. Right in my region here in Boston, Massachusetts, from 2021 to 22, there was a 35% increase in pedestrian deaths. But also in the United States, when we dig into those statistics, we find that more than half of the especially dangerous roads, the high um, crash roads are in predominantly black and Latinx neighborhoods, including the very dangerous high volume arterial roads that cut through those neighborhoods. So debates about sustainable and just cities go back decades and include efforts by Robert Bullard and others to think about equitable transportation systems and how to overcome transportation apartheid, as he called it. Um, the, the notion of driving while black became recognized as fatal. Black drivers and cyclists and pedestrians are frequently stopped, searched, and as the Black Lives Matter movement highlighted, sometimes killed by police. And of course, it was quickly pointed out that that also applied not just to black people, but to brown people and to indigenous people. And these injustices around freedom of movement date back to this country's history of slavery and segregation. Discriminatory controls over the mobility of African Americans, Native Americans, Hispanic Americans, and also some Asian American communities have been part of our history. Um, as you know, histories written by folks like Genevieve Carpio have shown um, in different ways in different regions of the country. So social movements have increasingly um, pointed out and in, uh, raised our awareness and our understanding of these intersectional mobility injustices. Let's move on to talk about, so why, why this is important for thinking about sustainable mobility futures. Much like earlier histories of segregation and of urban, um, so-called urban renewal, highway building, and so on, recent processes of green transition are also reshaping cities um, and, and exurban and suburban areas. And these are often linked to the displacement of racialized minorities and lower income neighborhoods in the process that's called green gentrification. The installation of placemaking features, which include things like bike lanes, pedestrian improvements, and green amenities in many cities, contributes to pushing out insecure renters to more affordable neighborhoods, which also are those which happen to be overburdened with environmental pollution and transport inequities and other inequities. And that's where the concept of just sustainabilities um, developed by Julian Aguiman and um, other collaborators, kind of talks to how we can imagine transformations in future cities, but also in future mobilities. 
in the face of these uneven changes in mobilities, I and other sociologists have theorized the dominant system of automobility as an interlocking set of social, political, economic, and spatial arrangements, as well as cultural understandings with these deep socio-ecological consequences. So grassroots struggles for transportation justice evolved in recent years and into these multiple social movements that are critical of urban planning and transport planning and understand these disciplines within a deeper historical context of racialism and colonialism. And that's where the concept of mobility justice started to come to play over and above and beyond transport equity. So the organization, um, the Untokening, for example, um, back in 2016 and 2017 was working um, on these uh, principles of mobility justice where they talked about the ways in which historical disenfranchisement, disinvestment, exposure to pollution, repressive policing in communities of color negatively impact our collective health, wealth, mobility, and security. And they were demanding that we excavate and recognize that historical experience and its relation to the current injustices experienced by communities of Black, Indigenous, and people of color, as well as uh, gendered and sexual minorities and um, people with disabilities and migrants and um, and the poor generally. And this um, evolved into an organization called People for Mobility Justice. And it forces us to ask which economic forces, social practices and contested politics are shaping future mobilities and immobilities and how they are experienced by different groups. And how do we make sense of these, these tensions and these countervailing currents in the contestation over mobility futures? How can we help bring about more equitable and just mobilities if we have this deeper um, historical understanding in mind? So mobilities are complex, they're global and local, they're entangled. And the dominant mobility systems involve these interlocking socio-ecological practices um, by which I refer to the kinds of energy systems and the resources that go into it. They involve racial regimes of um, you know, racialization of different groups of people and the spatialization of those racial um, boundaries. They involve industrial and business networks, geopolitical and military power that constructs borders and the flow of resources across borders, and the ongoing relations between mobility, energy production, extractive industries, land use, and displacement. And all of this kind of touches down in cities, in our urban environments, and suburban and exurban and rural in the ways in which different groups of people are affected by this dominant mobility regime. And this leads to the argument that a full transition away from the currently dominant automobility system will only take place if we simultaneously address the inequalities that underpin this unsustainability of the current system. So starting in 2011, um, I was beginning to argue for promoting mobility justice as integral to sustainability transitions. There will be no sustainability transition without a mobility justice revolution. So that brought me finally um, to the, the third part of my talk on mobile commoning um, in mobility's research and specifically mobile commoning as an ethics of care. In early work, um, the, the thinker and writer Ivan Illich was one of the first to note that the road has been degraded from a commons to a simple resource for the circulation of vehicles. And, you know, his work on, on sort of moving at the speed of a bicycle um, was a, an argument in the 1970s for kind of reclaiming the commons through how we practice mobilities. That kind of argument has been picked up on in more recent work um, by mobility scholars like Anna Nikoleva and her collaborators who argued that the commons lens can help us to envision more inclusive and collaboratively governed cities as part of a new politics of mobility that would allow for greener, more just mobilities. So beyond the individualized 
right to move, which is kind of enshrined in in um you know a lot of beliefs in in the United States, but in in settler colonial societies more broadly. Um, we can instead focus on how collective social needs are mediated through mobilities and immobilities. And in the mobilities work on commons, on the commons sort of approach, sometimes this refers to the things like um, shared vehicles and public mobility systems as a kind of commons, but it can also mean reducing energy consumption or fossil fuel consumption for the common good or it could mean producing shared spaces of communal access uh, and the critique of the kind of you know, suburban developments which each person has their privatized patch of a home and a backyard and a swimming pool. Um, and you know that this is contrary to the kind of commoning that we need for a sustainability transition. And what this leads to is a recognition that many of the mainstream policies for low carbon transitions and even debates about climate justice are often missing the more radical dimensions of mobile commoning, mobile commoning that would call for us to deprivatize mobilities at multiple scales. So if you look at this neighborhood, even if every house here had some solar panels on its roof and an electric car, um, you know, that, that wouldn't address this question of mobile commoning and, and the dominant system of automobility that would still be um, spatialized in that kind of neighborhood. So the community organizations that are related to this, um, it's crucial to recognize that community-based organizing is already happening around this kind of issue. And it tries to make sense of mobilities within the historical contextual development of racially segregated cities in North America. For example, the slow roll Chicago bicycle movement, co-founded by Jamal Julian and Olatunje Obai Reed in 2014, builds on community bicycling events to advocate what they describe as racial equity, increased mobility and racial justice to make lives better for black, brown, and indigenous people of color across the United States. And slow rolls have occurred across other cities, not just in Chicago, they've popped up in many places. And it's a kind of community bike ride. And they claim to mobilize bicycling, not just as, as transportation, but as a tool to build community health, cohesion, jobs, and that in turn can help build trust and counter urban violence. Slow Roll Chicago makes a point of bringing together otherwise fragmented and frightened communities around casual, slow cycling events that purposely de-emphasize cycling as transportation. As co-founder Reed explains, the aim is to bring communities together in a ritual of social cohesion, where they can move together in public spaces, share stories, and in doing so, improve individual health as well as rebuild community trust in neighborhoods shattered by violence. Once people build trust and cohesion, they're more likely to come out and support each other in other ways to support local businesses, to support you know, education programs, create local jobs, help suppress violence on their streets. So as their motto says, we ride bikes to make our neighborhoods better. This kind of communal self-mobilization is one model for what I describe as mobile commoning. Reed also has formed a organ new organization called Equiticity, which promotes wider mobility justice transformations. But I, what I hope you get a sense of is that mobile commoning is not about maximizing mobility or transport flow, um, level of service, uh, or even more public transit as a, as a right as an individual right, it's not simply about access. Instead, it implies an ethics of care, care that would protect human capabilities for mobility, but also by extension, more than human mobilities. That is, um, you know, the living world around us would benefit from this. And it promotes the kind of free spaces for a potential movement. And it requires some other kind of policies that would help promote that. Those include regulating excessive mobilities, 
limiting unnecessary speed, regulating corporations that profit from uneven mobilities, pricing the externalities of transportation, such as pollution and fossil fuel use, and preventing its harms. It implies that certain kinds of mobility need to be reduced and replaced where possible, and not simply with electric vehicles or automated vehicles. The path to sustainable mobilities will undoubtedly be a kinopolitical struggle. There's certainly a history of that with groups like Reclaim the Streets and Critical Mass historically that participated in what I call kinopolitical challenges in early decades, um, that is bringing together the kino movement and politics. But it's now seen in these movements like Equiticity and People for Mobility Justice and the Untokening, which continue to expand upon that in new ways today. Rather than simply being bicycle advocacy groups, we can frame these actions as kinopolitical movements for mobility justice. And rather than the mainstream narrative of an incremental change in daily transportation choices supported by emerging disruptive technologies leading to sustainable transportation, we can instead begin to imagine a broader mobility justice movement that would articulate goals around which diverse groups could coalesce and mobilize. So let me round up some thoughts on mobile commoning as an ethics of care. Mobility justice, as I mentioned, challenges green gentrification in cities where the racialized poor are displaced and unhoused, while new low carbon infrastructure seems to benefit largely the, the mainly white urban or suburban upper middle classes. Mobility justice in a wider scale, which I haven't gotten into too much here, but it also challenges what's called climate colonialism where the low carbon energy transition is premised on extractive sacrifice zones that further the displacement of rural and indigenous communities, especially for the sake of mining lithium, cobalt, bauxite, or rare earths to build new electric infrastructure. Mobility justice also challenges disabling environments and the spatialized violence of sexist, ageist, ableist, and cisgendered cities that exclude or marginalize diverse embodied mobilities and their places of gathering, resting, or commoning. And mobility justice challenges national bordering practices that criminalize some people as illegals and intrusively over police, sorry, the everyday mobilities and dwelling places of all ethnic minorities, of indigenous peoples, of incarcerated peoples, of deported peoples, and so on, the people in detention of different kinds. So then ethics of care would challenge, critique each of these and advocate for mobility justice in a more careful practice of mobilities. So in conclusion, I would want to say that an ethics of care in mobilities requires that we limit the impacts of our mobilities on others and we try to synchronize or harmonize our movements and our energy use with the needs of the natural world, that is of the more than human world. Secondly, that we recognize the racialized harm and ongoing mobility inequities and insist that there be infrastructural reparations, things like payment of climate debt for uh, climate loss and damages. Uh, and that can be done in multiple ways to address these kind of wider socio-ecological systems that are being exacerbated by uh, the changing climate emergency that we're living in. Thirdly, we would need to shift planning power away from the groups who I refer to as kinetic elites and the industries of carbon capital, capital through the democratization and the decolonization of decision-making and urban and transport planning. Fourth, we would need to restrain the overconsumption of energy and excessive travel, including air travel. Fifth, create rules for commoning and promote an ethics of caring mobilities. And finally, reduce the harm, inequities, and injustices of the systems I've described through the kinds of po policies and processes and movements for mobile commoning that I believe are already happening and that can be further advanced. 
So I would like to stop at that point and hope we have time for some questions and discussion. I've also included my email here, mscheller at wpiedu, if anyone wants to get in touch personally. And I will stop sharing my screen so that hopefully I can see some of you in the audience. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mimi. That was wonderful and very interesting. And I'm sure that it's gonna stimulate a lot of questions. Let's give folks a moment to um, think there questions through and when they're ready you can please raise a hand and I'll try to moderate the chat for us. Okay, so I've been while people are thinking I I will, I'm definitely happy to get the conversation started. Um and this is I hope people don't see this as being a bit too self-serving, and I'm not sure if I wanted to ask you this question publicly or behind closed doors, but one of the perennial things that I struggle with as, as you know, the project director for our initiative is, um, you know, our decision to largely work with uh, government partners and in, in trying to make incremental changes towards better and more just outcomes um, while acknowledging lots of community focused, you know, work as well, but maybe less of an emphasis on, on disrupting power relationships as much as probably would be required, um, you know, as per the mobility justice theory. And I just wonder, um, if you've thought about that at all and whether or not you could articulate where you might see the limits of our approach being, like where uh, in terms of achieving more just outcomes mm -hmm. in plain language. And when you say our, you mean who exactly? Our initiative, I guess. Yeah, the, the work that we're doing in this project to kind of um, build more evidence, uh, update planning processes, create more equitable engagement practices, and, and, and so on. I know you're not an expert on our project, but yeah. generally speaking, we tend to be. My, one of my students made a mug for me when she graduated. It's like, you know, changing the world one tiny incremental step at a time. And <laughs> yeah, that's kind of been our approach, but wondering where you see the limits to that being and, yeah. you know, eat. I feel mean, free to be very honest and critical. It's fine. Right. Um, I, I have to say, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not, so I'm not the practitioner who per se is doing this, this kind of work. And I turn to colleagues, um, particularly those in the group called the untokening, which, which, you know, was a group of people of people of color and, different minoritized identities who were in that world of transport planning and um, recognizing that they were being invited to the table only in a token fashion, right? The token person of color in the room or the token, um, okay, let's ask this community, what do what's their input on this plan that we've come up with? And so they were really kind of shake up the system in a way by saying that that's not sufficient. It's not sufficient to have a token person of color at the table if you're not beginning seriously from the issues, the concerns, the voices, the everyday understandings of the people involved in that community um, that the plan is being <laughs> planned for, I guess you would say. Um, so their, I mean, I think their principles of mobility justice are really, um, important to to begin from and one of the things they talk about is epistemic justice because where we begin from um in what when you refer to the our group right is often from an academic from a professional from an educated voice and ways of understanding the world ways of communicating a sort of technical um framework uh and that's not the way everyday people, are, you know, to use a, a lay term, um, experience and talk about their issues around mobility. 
And so that's one of the problems to begin with is like the very language we are using and the concepts and the, especially the quantification, the data. And I know you've been talking about data and evidence and we, you know, we want to have evidence informed policy, but many of those forms of collecting and gathering and presenting data are um, themselves within certain kinds of quantifying epistemic frameworks. Um, Adonio Lugo in particular has done a lot of work on, on thinking about this. And so what does it mean to use more qualitative storytelling, collaborative co-construction of knowledge, um, participatory action research? I don't know, whatever. Those are some ways a social scientist might approach it. Um, and of course, there's different time frames for doing that. So our sense of time and temporality also matters in that. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. And um, certainly going to center those those notions as we continue to evolve ourselves as a project. And yeah. Okay. Um, I see lots of questions now in the chat. Um, I will maybe turn to Dominic. You suggest to shift planning power from the kinetic elites and carbon capital through democracy democratization and decolonization of the decision-making process. Do you have any examples and how would this government work? Well, that's interesting. You kind of just spoke to that a little bit in your last comment, but maybe for a specific example, do you have one? Yeah. And, and I, and I think this actually might tie into, um, there's some additional questions further down from um, Antonio Pe Pez about rules of commoning. And let me, link that to this question, because when I talk about rules of commoning, I'm drawing on the work of theorists of commoning. So one theorist is um, beginning with the work of Eleanor Ostrom. And Eleanor Ostrom was the person who wrote um, a critique of the idea of the tragedy of the commons. The tragedy of the commons by Gareth Hardin was this idea that once you have a sort of common pool resource, everybody will just come in and use it all up and it'll be this kind of struggle of you know war of all against all and very hobbesian and and that will wreck it um and what ostrom argued uh, as an economist was that actually in most human societies where there is a kind of common resource people figure out ways of sharing it they actually limit themselves in their use of it so that there will be some left for others and for future generations. Now, when you hear future generations and limiting use of resources, you can also really clearly hear the ring of indigenous uh, ontologies from around the world, right? Many indigenous cultures in Canada, in Australia, in the US, in Latin America, right? They self-limit their use of common pool resources. Um, also, I draw on the work of George Cafensis and Silvia Federici. And Federici or Federici um, wrote extensively about the ways in which forms of commoning are constantly emerging. It's not, and it's not just the idea that there is this like forest or this ocean that is a common pool resource, but that we, as people, we create social forms of sharing and social, these social forms or structures or rules of sharing are emerging all the time. They emerge in everyday life. They emerge when we share space, when we share food, when we, um, even when you're driving, I mean, yes, there's a lot of aggressive driving that happens, but also there's a lot of people who pause and stop and like wave and say like, go ahead, go ahead. And they let, they let someone in. Like people just do that. It's a form of social interaction. So the question is what kinds of democratization of the governance of mobilities would help foster that kind of commoning to emerge. And what that means is you could take maybe the example of those, um, oh, I forget what they're called, those like Swedish roads where they take out all the markings and stuff and like people kind of get to the intersection. Shared, shared streets or, yeah. It's not, there's a special word for it, but yeah. And, and you just have to like negotiate across that intersection. That's like one way to imagine that, but imagine that in bigger scales, like what would it mean to negotiate our way together 
with others around wider systems of mobility beyond just crossing an intersection. And I, and I think that's what this would be getting at. And it's a little hard to like give an example that wedges into our current way of doing things. I mean, we try a little bit with these like stakeholder engagement processes where we sort of make plans and then we open them up for public discussion, but those are not quite getting fully at what I'm suggesting. Good. So, um, yeah, I welcome anyone else with a question to raise their hand. And in the meantime, um, uh, from David Brake, really good to see an approach that recognizes that at least at the margins, changes to improve mobility may or should involve less mobility for some groups and decision makers need to be more accepting of changes that involve real mobility sacrifices for some to enable more mobility for others. Not a question, so I'll just add, what do you think? <laughs> to make that a question. So yeah, where yeah. are we going with this perennial, you know, this major question about curbing excess mobility of, of some in order to equalize the mobility for all? Or Yes, and that's where we're really bad at making political decisions or policies to limit mobilities. There's such a sense of um, righteous righteousness that we have a right to as much mobility as we each want and the problem with that is um i i always uh, refer to the the work um on co2 emissions where we talk about everybody needs to reduce their co2 emissions right but when you look at it um when you quantify it that if the upper tier uh, like the top 10% of users of energy just brought their emissions down to the average, we would solve, we would reduce greenhouse gas emissions by like 50%. And, and so like a small percentage are contributing a much bigger amount. And so you get to a point where you say, actually some people that, who are poor in mobility or restrained, restricted in mobility, they actually need more um, energy to be available in their lives to get around. And those who are over consuming need to restrict their consumption. And there are very few policies that actually will say, very few politicians or policymakers who will say like, yes, we believe in restricting mobility and energy consumption. It's, it's, it's like against our principles and somehow our, um, our sense of freedom and of capitalism. But unless we do that, I think we're not going to have a low carbon transition that's sustainable. Yeah, I think I think you're spot on. And just in, in the Canadian case, um, if we look to Vancouver, uh, toying with the idea of uh, congestion charges at the, at the current time, they're really thinking of, of um, Somehow um, they know that they need to reallocate space in order to achieve their climate targets. They need more cycling, more pedestrian. And the way that they'll do it is through a pricing mechanism, right? Uh, to make it, I don't want to say palatable, but you know, at least you know, something that supports a, a transition in that direction. But I think pricing is also going to be a very difficult way, along with space reallocation to curb excess mobility politically. Yep. yep. Okay. Lots of questions in the chat. Have you had a chance to look through them? And I yeah. Um, so I'm looking at the one about um, I'm looking at the one about quantitative approaches, numbers, data, models as a way to communicate with policymakers. That's one of our PhD students, so it'd be lovely to address that question. Good yeah. one, right? Versus um, Antonio saying he would argue that storytelling is an easier way to communicate with policymakers. Um, telling good stories is as hard as doing good data work. Um, interesting, but as a tool for communication, stories win every time. I, I, I'm with you, Antonio. I like that comment. I mean, I think they they each have their place, right? We Data is important and it's quantitative data. We need to understand through measuring certain kinds of phenomena and what's happening. But like I said, in terms of changing policy and policymaking and po 
politics. It's it's stories that will win. It's it's rhetorical arguments that that will make a difference. And one of the things um, we see, unfortunately, is um, is a kind of a rhetoric and narratives um, around the freedom of the car, right? And the and the reass the assertion of fossil fuels and car cultures and the right to drive, you know, a pickup truck that weighs two tons if you want to. And that has drowned out the sort of quantifiers, the data on the green sustainable side, right? No matter how much greenhouse gas measurements you get and carbon reduction and all of that, the people telling the story of the freedom um, to move are winning those arguments. And that's why we need stronger mobility justice arguments. We need mobility justice arguments that will connect across more communities and more social movements and interests and needs and actors where they recognize themselves in that story and that narrative so that they see that it will it will help everybody more. Um, I'll take. Yeah, just to continue on on this conversation a little bit, I think that um, stories win, but but I also like I think the audience matters there as well. So I would separate, say, decision makers from technocrats, and and um, you know one of the major barriers we have in terms of achieving more epi epistemological epistemic justice is that our planning processes don't currently allow for the recognition of kind of small sample qualitative understandings, right? To, to really directly shape um, policy in a lot of cases in transportation. And 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 so so I think that there's a major challenge at that level. Um, I think going to decision makers, it'll actually be easier to change decisions with narratives, but somehow changing the processes um, are hard to do with with those narrative approaches. And wondering if there are areas right. outside of transportation where that's more the norm, and you know, or and that's or, yeah. I mean, that's where I, when I talk about stories or narratives, um, I don't necessarily mean that we listen to single individual um, anecdotal one at a time stories. And so like, for example, later tonight, I'm gonna be um, on a webinar with the, the Worcester City um, Mobility Action Plan, uh, which is for more equitable and sustainable transportation. And there will be a, a sort of task force and a, and a sort of public webinar where we talk about some of the issues and then they'll seek public comment, right? And, and members of the public will, will come on, they will tell their stories. They will complain about the bus service. They will complain about the danger of the streets. They will talk about the poor schedules and the accidents, what, whatever it is they talk about. And those will be seen as stories and they will be like, we've listened to those. I, what I'm talking about instead would be more of a larger movement, a movement of people in organized, right, collectively to represent themselves in numbers and in voice and in a larger story. And that's what pushes social change, right, is if you have an effective social movement. Um, certainly we see um, people who are living with various kinds of disabilities who have critiqued the framing of the way disabilities have been framed, right, and critical disabilities approaches, and have pushed that policymaking arena in new directions, and passed new laws and implemented changes, and it takes um, struggles, what I call kino political struggles, to to make that happen. Okay, um, very limited time here. Uh... Rafa's had his hand up for some minutes, and I think after Rafa's question, I'll have to end the session formally, but there are lots of great questions still unanswered in the chat, so happy to keep the conversation going uh, past past four. Don't know what, where people have to go, but let's have Rafa's last question, and uh, 
then maybe the rest can can happen after we say goodbye. Rafa, Great. thank you, thank you, Steve. Uh, hi, Mimi. Uh, Rafael Pereira here. Oh, hi. Uh, always always good to hear your presentations. Uh, so I think um I think we are all on board on the idea of limiting people's uh, conspicuous consumption, and there is this growing uh, philosophical movement on, called limitarianism that we should limit people's uh, behavior to some extent in the sense that they're removing, reducing their ex uh, environmental externalities that they impose on others. Uh, however, I, although I'm completely on board with the argument from a philosophical point of view, when we start to think about this from a policy or practical point of view, it becomes always or very often very difficult to untangle from people's behavior how much of their decisions, how much of their travel choices, how much of their residential choices and consumption choices in general, how much of those are actual choices or you know, their behaviors limited by the constraints they have? How much can we separate their, uh, can we make people fully responsible for their choices and how much of those choices are actually limited because of you know, socioeconomic conditions and so on and so forth. And I think making this distinction has an extremely important political and philosophical uh, relevancy in terms of making uh, justifiable or legitimate interventions in reducing people's, uh, let's say, consumption or travel behavior. How can we go around this challenge of untangling people's uh, choices in terms of preferences, con conspicuous consumption, expensive tastes, and you know, lack lack of choices, so to speak? Yeah. So when I am talking about limits and excessive consumption, I'm talking about people at the really high end of choice, voluntary mobility and energy consumption. So I'm not talking about just like, say, a congestion charge, like you said, because a congestion charge is so um, proportionately disparate depending on your needs, your income, your where you live, all of these different factors. Um, and in fact, could make center cities, which are very expensive already, only accessible to the wealthy, right? So I'm talking about the people who are flying around in private jets all the time and saying, well, they need to do that for their work or their lifestyle or whatever. There was just a study of, um, there's, a, there's a private airport outside of Boston and they wanted to expand and build an additional runway. And the community has actually protested against it. And um, partly, probably because they don't want more planes flying around, but also on um, environmental grounds that we should not be building extra runways for private jet use. And they collected all the data on what were supposed to be business flights and they found that many of them are not going to business places. Many of these business flights are actually people going on vacation in their private jets with their families. And why would we cater to that by building a whole another runway? Um, I mean, and that's that's one extreme example on the, the jet end of things, but there's other ways. In do, which... Hummer, do Hummers fall in the same category? Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, another question about excessive mobility is this whole question about the two and a half ton electric truck, right? Like how many Americans really need to get the electric truck with that much battery power to get them around in that vehicle? And are they really using it for necessities and for work as they might claim when it's, you know, the, you know, the pickup truck is the number one selling vehicle in, in the United States. Um, so yeah, the, the problem is you do get, you get backlash movements, right? So uh, obviously a libertarian movement is going to be hit um, up against a libertarian movement. And that's the political problem is how do we make the case to more people to embrace a limit, libertarian movement? I think that's the, for me, that's the challenge. Well, it's always great to end a symposium with a big question for us to ponder moving <laughs> forward into the next year of our project as well. So, um, Professor Mimi Scheller, thank you so much uh, for sharing with us today. Um, it's been a, a really 
I was almost nervous to ask you to come because I just hold you in such high regard. So um so pleased that you said yes. And I hope that we have a chance to interact more as time goes on. Thank so on behalf so of everyone here, yeah, a big thank you. And um also um I'll give you one of these, which is a new feature. Uh so <laughs> did your computer do it? I don't know. No, mine have, didn't do it. You have to have um, oh cool. You have to have the special. Uh, oh, nice. Yeah. So, um, That's awesome. Uh, it's been a great, it's been a great symposium, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for attending. Uh, uh, please go to our website, check out the resources, check out our reports. Uh, uh, we'll have links to all of the presentations online. And uh, just, you know, keep coming back because we've got three more years of, of funding for this project and lots of great things and results and change to come so um yeah Mimi any last words from you and then um uh, thank, just thank you so much it's been a pleasure to be here great turnout wonderful audience and I'm happy to share my slides somebody asked about so um I'll pass those over to you too it's been thanks really nice thank, thank you. you okay thanks Mimi bye -bye. so I'll, I'll leave. there seems to be still conversation happening in the chat so we don't have to end the the meeting yet but for those who need to go want to go by all means uh thanks so much and we'll stop the recording now thanks bye bye bye